Hey, Joe, how are you? <laughs> Doing great. The last time I had you on, it was during mask season. Yeah. And if you remember, I texted you from the airport and said, I'll pay you $10 if you refuse <laughs> you to wear your mask. Uh, and I think you complied with that. Yeah, I went through the whole Pittsburgh airport uh, with a drink in my hand, so I didn't have to wear oh, a mask. I, I was found a, a loophole where I was able to to not get in trouble and also get ten dollars. Exactly. Well, it's good to have you back on the show. It's good to how, be back on the how show. How are things? Because when you were on last time, you had somewhat recently started with Catholic Answers. Yeah. Since that time, it's been great working for Catholic Answers, and I think I have one more book and one more child since last time we spoke. Okay. Yeah. What's the new book? Uh, the book is the Eucharist is really Jesus. That's right. And so it's, it's trying to explore Eucharistic theology in a little different way. So a lot of books say, here's the Bible verses that show the Eucharist is true. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to do some of that, but also trying to show like, here's how this interacts with the cross. Here's how this interacts with what we believe about the covenant. Here's how this interacts with what we know about the nature of worship. So that it's not just, you know, C.S. Lewis has that quote, that he believes in the Son not just because he can see it, but yes. that he can see all things by it. And I think something's true Similarly with the Eucharist, that we can both see that it's true mm. and we can see other things. By from it. its effects. Yeah. Or from the effects it has on the faithful. And that's what it means to say it's the source and the summit. It's the summit. It's the high point of faith. But it's also the source. And so other things are connected to it, even if we don't normally realize that. I just realized it may have been wrong that you said, I got a new kid and a new book. And went, tell me about your new book. <laughs> <laughs> You're a man. <laughs> tell me about your new kid, I guess. <laughs> if we... No, it's okay. So Kansas, you live in Kansas. Yeah, I do. And you know who else now lives in Kansas? I <laughs> do. <laughs> I think I know where you're going with this. Taylor Swift. Yes. I could not tell you one of her songs. I don't. I, oh no. Yes, I could. That Romeo and Juliet one she uh, did a yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. years ago. She's had a lot of different. I guess you could call them eras. Love story. I think it's called. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so to prove my good credentials with. Yeah. Look, I am slightly ashamed to admit I'm a little bit of a Catholic Swifty. Are you? I mean, I. I She's got a lot of catchy songs, and she's a very good songwriter. Some, I'm a very, like, I, I don't know a lot about the musical side of stuff, and I'll admit that. I love lyrics, and she's a clever lyricist. I think I'd say that. There's something cool about someone fully owning something that's not cool, like yes. being into Taylor Swift, you know, just something going all in based. on that. It's, it's like acknowledging you like pumpkin spice lattes yeah, or something. Right? I don't. I don't but, care. I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> exactly. Like, that's a real man. Yeah. I, I wear socks and sandals. I don't really, but you know, it's, it's about that level of cool. Yeah, yeah. Very good. And so what's it like working for Catholic Answers but living in Kansas? Yeah. So all but one of the Catholic Answers apologists now live in the Midwest. So, oh, wow. I, you know, Trent Horn started this trend. He moved out to Texas during COVID because everything was remote anyway. Yep. And so why not live somewhere for half the price? And uh, I started and they said, you can either come and live in California or Kansas City. And it was not a hard choice. Well, right. I mean, well, look, my wife's from California. I love California. I People knock on California all the time. I get why people live there. There's a lot to like about it. It's it beautiful. is also insanely expensive. And so it's like, well, would you like to pay extremely high prices <laughs> while your kids fall into apostasy? <laughs> or <laughs> would you like them to stay Catholic for less? And after carefully deliberating those two options. No, that's right. You would have to say to Catholic Answers, I'm going to need like a lot more money if you need me to move to California. Yeah. And thankfully, they've been very flexible with it. I fly out maybe once a quarter or so to do, you know, video and, and things. But they they flew Zach from our video department out to set up a little studio <laughs> space in I'm the basement. I'm so glad that they kind of moved with the times, as it were, because it's tempting for companies that have been around for a while to keep doing things the same way. Yeah. So it's, to it's allow right. that freedom allows them to have you and Trent and Jimmy, even though they're not on location. Yeah, and I, I know that it's a it comes at a cost, right? Like there's something to be said about having those times together, and that's really good. But there's also something to be said about having times with your family and being, you know, my whole family, with the exception of my brother, uh, all four of my sisters and, the, you know, the 14 uh, grandkids my parents have are all in the Kansas City area. So yeah. having that kind of community for my kids to grow up in is, is huge. It's, it's really valuable. Very cool. And did they... You have a podcast now, a video podcast. I do. What is the name of it? Shameless Popery. That's good. You've brought that back. Yes. Because <laughs> that was the name of your blog before Yeah, you that's right. Uh, in 2009, I started good. a blog by that name. So. Thursday, can we put a link to that below? Because uh, that's wonderful. So did they fly to you and set up the studio in your house? Or how did they work? did. So, yeah, I'd been just, you know, doing a normal video in front of the camera thing. Originally, they sent me some video equipment. They just mailed it out, and I had to try to <laughs> assemble it, and, it, you know, it showed. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> but then they actually flew Zach out to to set it up, and he did all sorts of stuff with the lighting, and nice. we rearranged the whole basement, and uh, it's going to be uh, insane if I ever have to move. But and are your kids homeschooled? Uh, so my daughter goes. So I ask it's, because it's I'm four. wondering what it's like to film at home with oh, children. Oh, it's, That's it's, where I'm it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my kids are four, two, and uh, under a year. And oh, so, I see. So the only one who's really school age is the four-year-old. She goes to school at a Montessori, mm-hmm. like a Catholic Montessori, for three half days. So yeah. the rest of the time, homeschooled. Both I was homeschooled for a few years. My wife was homeschooled until college. And and so we've had some very positive experiences with it. And we're going to kind of wait and see. Uh, yeah. but, but all that's to say, you're right. If you're imagining that it's chaotic in the house... It's worse than you think. <laughs> so, yeah, I, li- I lived in Atlanta, and we had a little studio set up in the basement, and it was it was not fun. Yeah. So when I'm doing actual recording, the, we we have a townhouse. So it's, it's kind of slender, but it's tall, so they can mm-hmm. be on the top floor, and then we had a floor in between, mm-hmm. and so you you aren't picking up too much of the sound. But even even so, there's still occasionally you'll get little. The attentive listener may notice, oh, it sounds like there's some <laughs> chaos or violence in the background. And right. it's probably my, my son exploring which things are breakable. <laughs> and then finding out a lot that are. So you've done a lot of work on Mormonism. Uh, at least I've been seeing YouTube videos from when you've done it. What? So when you kind of got this job at Catholic Answers, did you just decide for yourself, I'm going to investigate different topics like the Eucharist, like Mormonism? Do they direct you to do that? What else have you been looking into? So there's very little direction in that sense. I'll sometimes get suggestions where they say, hey, we don't have a lot of videos on X topic. Is this something you're interested in? That's kind of how, and it's always very invitational. They've never said, you have to record on on this subject. And it goes at the speed of my own interest. And I've never been diagnosed as having ADHD, but I would be shocked if I didn't. And so the number of like interests that I get super passionate about and go deep on and then get distracted and go deep on something else works really well for a podcast because I can spend as long as I want exploring a particular topic and then jump over to another one. So when I started with Catholic Answers, I didn't think like, I'm going to be the Mormon guy. I'm going to you yeah. know be the guy who responds to LDS claims. But no, the whole way that started, I'd been doing a video on being charitable in apologetics. And I gave the example that a lot of times we're not very charitable with the Mormons. You know, people are often mocking and dismissive and it's not helpful. They might talk about burning a LDS book. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify that. <clears throat> I wasn't saying you should go to a Mormon and steal their books and set them on fire. But it seems to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that if something is clearly a false revelation of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. then it deserves to be done away with. And by that, I, I'm not yet at the point where I'm saying we steal them from people's houses and burn them. But in the same, in the same way, you might get like a copy of the sort of Jehovah's Witness translation. Mm-hmm. What's that called? The New World Translation? Yeah. Where it clearly has errors in it rega- yeah. in John's gospel. Like s- actually setting fire to a Bible is the appropriate way to do away with the Bible, by the way, or to bury it. So if I had uh, an extra copy of Mormon at home, I'd, I'd absolutely have no problem burning it. Yeah, so this Feel is... Feel free to, you know, push back well, there. Well, let me, let me nuance it. Yeah. Because the church has always said error has no rights. And that's true, but erroneous people do have rights. And so hmm. in a world in which Mormons didn't exist and you just had books of Mormon lying around because all the Mormons had converted to Catholicism, we'd say, okay, we don't really need these anymore. We're going to burn them. They're, they're, you know, or maybe we'll keep a few for reference copies or, you know, they have some historical import, but we don't want people misled by the false mm-hmm. claims. But in a world in which this is something valuable and meaningful to people, that even if it's wrong, there's a certain deference to the human person that you want to say, how do I respectfully treat you as someone who venerates this mm-hmm. rather than just destroying the stuff that, that you believe in, <laughs> even well, if the stuff you believe in is, is wrong? Is there a kind of religion, and we will use the, rel- the term religion loosely here, that you would not hold that view? Like- yeah. So if it's directly opposite, so I'll give you an example. In the fall, I think, of last year, uh, there was the situation in the Iowa State Capitol where a man came in and destroyed the statue of Satan that was there in the state capitol. Absolutely uh, appropriate. St. Boniface of our day. And uh, he's actually represented by friends of ours. So they're, they're his lawyers. And yeah, I think that's This is a case where it's not an authentically held belief. It's mocking God and it's mocking Christianity. And here it is on state grounds. I don't see a good case to say that that should be left up, A, because of the context of where it is, and B, because of what it's saying. 
But the fact that somebody gets something wrong, I think we need to be very careful. I'm going to err on the side of caution of being respectful of people's false views, Mm -hmm. trying to correct them. But if we, you know, if we go all Savonrola. Well, what about this? Because I already stated that I'm not talking about going into a Mormon's home or stealing their books and burning. But if you walk past one of those public little libraries, the little boxes Mm -hmm. they sometimes have, if there was a book of Mormon in there, it's not, I probably wouldn't do it. I don't care that much. But I think it would be completely appropriate to take it and throw it in the trash. Yeah, or I think in that case, because there you're you're not, it doesn't have the same insult to the human person as, as a, doing it to like to somebody to or somebody, in front yeah. of them. And you're just keeping it away from, and I think if you find garbage books in a, right. one of those little free libraries, you're totally justified to say, I don't want people reading these books. Right. I'm going to get and, rid of and, them. And I think like, I think I can, I get why that's offensive to the Mormon watching. But I also think that if the Mormon watching tries to understand it from my perspective, namely, this is misleading Christians and this is a false revelation, if that is the case, Mormon, and you say, well, it's not. Okay, but if it is the case and it's claiming to be true things about Jesus Christ, then do you see why it might be inappropriate? Right. Then maybe they could take the example of another book. Well, here's an idea. Like, what if um, John Smith... decided he was receiving a revelation and it was a new revelation Mm -hmm. and that all the other Christian denominations plus Mormonism had fallen into apostasy and he was here to reinstate the true Christian religion. And there was now this document that said that Jesus said things, did things. Okay. The Mormon would look at that and say, that's false, presumably. Right. And therefore they would probably treat that with the sort of attitude I would want to treat theirs with. Now, they might not go the whole way and say we should burn it, but. Right, I think, and so I think that the question is in that last little clause. The yeah. So certainly, we don't have to venerate false holy books. We don't have to honor them. We don't have to treat them with a special respect. Mm. Uh, the question is, well, what do we do about them? Because there's a lot of garbage books out there that aren't even, you know. I mean, so I may have just, um, I may be contradicting myself here. Maybe I'm talking myself out of this because if I found a um, apocryphal gospel, say yeah, Thomas yeah. or something. I would want to keep on. I would want to keep that. But I think that, no, I think the difference is the reason I'd want to keep that is because no one's reading that right now and being misled into some false religion. This is, this is exactly the distinction. I mean, a lot of what we know about Gnosticism prior to the discovery of the Nag Hammadi library came from Christians explaining what Gnosticism was in order to respond to it. So, you know, the early Christians read a lot of Gnostic texts. Okay. They didn't just consign them all to the flames. They, yes. they were clearly reading up on them and treating them with the respect to know what they taught in order to rebut the falsehood. And so, you know, uh, St. Irenaeus and Against Heresies is the best single source prior to the 20th century on Gnosticism. And it's true, the Gnostic texts, after the Gnostics converted, their texts were eventually destroyed. And actually, this was a huge historical loss. You know, we know less about Gnosticism than we otherwise would have. So I think you're you're tapping into something really important. There's three possible reasons to preserve the text. One is because you think it's true. That's not applicable here. Two is you think it's important for some kind of historical sort of reason. Uh, and three is in order to respond to the false claims it's making. And so... You know, to that end, if, if you're someone who spends your entire life debunking a certain political view, say, you probably have a library full of the view you disagree with. Um, this was sometimes referred to as the hell shelf in seminary because you would have all of the books that you needed to rebut. Yeah. And because if you didn't have that, how are you going to know what, what people are saying? So, yeah, it, it's more complicated than just yeah. let's, let's torch them all. Totally, which is not what I said. I know you, yes, no, no, I know you but, know that, but just to, yeah. Um, so did you, have you ever had a Mormon take you up on a debate? Because we tried to do that and the guy said yes. And then he backed out and deleted all of his comments saying uh, that he backed out. And someone told me that would happen. And I thought, well, I'm sh- this guy seems reasonable. And, but no, it, it happened. We've had some good, let's see if we can set something up kind of uh, conversations, but it hasn't come to the point of actually doing the debate. And some of that is actually on my end of just being busy. Mm. So I don't know if there's going to be a back out or not, uh, but we'll, we'll see. Though I'm, I'm hopeful in this regard. I'm not going to name any names, but mm. I will say that the LDS typically discourage debate. Okay. And that's a pretty institutional sort of uh, discouragement of debate because that's not how they want to approach determining the truth. They're much bigger on 
pray on it and look for that feeling in your heart that you know it's right. Or it might, to say it more cynically, it might be for the same reason that Planned Parenthood doesn't debate, because they would be, <laughs> right. they would be exposed. Right. I think absolutely it. that's true. I, and I think there's often a cynical yeah. view of debate. I even hear this from Catholics saying, oh, well, there's no use debating religion on Facebook or online. And I think that's just utterly false. There's no use doing it badly of just like shouting in, a, in an incoherent kind of way, but that's true of any kind of approach. If you do it well, I've seen people actually change their mind on things. And maybe it's not the person you're directly interacting with, but if you carry yourself in a charitable, logical way, and you've, you've done a good job of presenting the truth and love, maybe somebody reading that says, aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. I, you know, I've had my mind changed by things I've read online. I'm sure everyone has. I mean, unfortunately, because it's usually wrong stuff. But mm. the, the point is we, we have this both we broadly, but I think this is true in a particular way with the LDS, this sort of uh, sourness towards debate and argumentation and all of that, that isn't a good position for a Christian to have. You know, if iron sharpens iron. Yeah, then, it's an understandable reaction. Yeah. But it's, it, you're, you're, I totally agree with you. It would be like if you grew up in a household where your parents fought and were kind of mean, vicious to each other. Yeah. And then you might say, you know, married couples shouldn't be arguing. Right, right. What you mean is they shouldn't be vicious, not that they shouldn't, you know, propose premises that lead to <laughs> conclusions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's, 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 things, no, yeah. this is a, it's a very good analogy because the history of Mormonism in America is often fraught with uh, violence and feelings of persecution and real persecution. And so understandably, I mean, this is a group that is regularly maligned and spoken falsely of. And so they're going to be a little cynical of the idea that debate is going to lead to the truth. Now, ironically, one of the reasons those falsehoods flourish is because they don't just go back and forth in a way that, that brings the truth out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. I, uh, I don't think there's any shame in choosing not to debate at all. Um, but no, I, saying, I'm, glad, I'm glad you say saying that you will because debate and then some people are up. not called to it. I'm not, I wouldn't be good at it. Right. You're, you're a very good interviewer. You're good at asking good questions I hope so. and, and not everyone is called to, yeah, to that kind of contentious style. Yeah. And I think it's really important that people have self-awareness there. Right. Like I actually think it's a virtue that I know I wouldn't do well in a debate setting and then I choose not to debate. But I have seen people debate who I think really, really should have been told this is not your gift. Yeah. In the church too, I've seen it recently where I'm like, oh, just let Trent do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Let Jimmy do it. Like, do you, so do you feel equipped to do it? I'm sure you would do it. I mean, I used job. to be a litigator and I was okay, uh, so, yes. a high school and college debater for eight years. Well, so I, I saw you in dialogue with... Uh, Who's the fella? Gavin Orland? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I thought that was a really excellent... And I think maybe I pushed that more in a debatey way than he was comfortable with. I didn't yeah. try to, but I just naturally, like, I want to be very charitable. I think he's a good man, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of things he just seemed to be getting substantively wrong. And I wanted to push back on them. And I, I probably pushed back a little harder than I, I should have in that. And so maybe it would have been better to just have it set up as a debate or something. Because I, I, I didn't want to abuse his his generosity of, of doing a dialogue. Well, yeah, it's a humbling thing to choose to do a debate, or it can be, yeah. in similar way to why it might be uh, a humbling thing to be a, uh, a professional athlete, where people are watching you, yes, and there's no excuses anymore. Like, you're on camera, and you didn't do well. You fumbled that ball or something or other, and you could have always done things better. And it's easy to criticize if you're not the one on the hot seat, right. but yeah. Yeah, it, I think it's the letting down the team thing also mm. comes in in a different way. You know, something like this. I don't have to do any real preparation to sit down and have a conversation with you. But I'll tell you, you know, like a professional athlete, you may see them for an hour or a few hours on game day, but they're doing a lot of work that you're not seeing. And if they're not, that's going to show up. Yeah. You're going to see the difference. Yeah, well, yeah. likewise, Trent spins an enormous amount of time preparing for debates. I was stunned when I realized how much time he spent. So you see him for, you know, an hour or a few hours and you just think, oh, that guy's really smart. And he is, but he also was thinking about every possible way the conversation could go and preparing for it. I mean, it's, it's an incredible skill set, but also takes a lot of discipline and diligence. And so there's a reason that there are plenty of smart people who have a natural gift of persuasion who can't do what someone like Jimmy or Trent does, 
because they're not putting in the time and the effort and they're not reading all of this stuff and they're not doing all of that preparation. So, you know, they wouldn't tell you that, but I'll tell you that about them. They're, they're extremely disciplined and that's the key to how they're able to, to seem like they just have everything at their fingertips because they got it there. They, they did the work to put it there. Now you said you're pretty sure you have ADD and I, whatever you mean by that, I'm pretty sure I'm the same. One of the beautiful things about hosting this show is talking to different people about a whole yeah. host of topics that they have anything to do with the church to philosophy specifically. Or, whereas like back in the day when I spoke, Focus solely on pornography. I was glad to. I, I, <laughs> There's uh, some context that I hope people know. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. You become numb to that. You know, people go, "Hey, you're the porn guy." I'm like, I get it. It was funny for five seconds ten years ago when I realized the joke. Now I don't care. It's still funny to me. So I want yeah, to speak no, on behalf you... of people who still enjoy that joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and was honored to to kind of take that role to write those books. Yeah. And if I'm called upon to do it again, praise the Lord. I'd I'd be honored. But it is nice to focus and just... This is one of the things that's great about working for Catholic Answers mm. is I can kind of move at the speed of my interests and go mm. where I'm interested. And it seems like you've got the same thing. If you want to have a guest on on a particular topic, you just say, who do I want to have on this week? And there's something very liberating about that. It, it's is, just what, like have good conversations. So what's your job description then? I mean, I used to work at Catholic Answers. Yeah. By the way, you said earlier sometimes they'll bring something up. Is this something you'd be interested in? And you can say no. Yeah. Well, back in the day when I worked for them, back in 2012, yeah. they asked me if I'd be interested in giving assembly addresses on bullying. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't I don't think so. Pro uh, or anti? <laughs> right. Well, yeah, anti. But I don't know. Now I think I'm okay with a bit of bullying. You know, like now I feel like we've swung so far in the opposite direction. You know, we joke, but uh, <clears throat> Greg Lukanoff, is that his name? The guy who co-wrote uh, The Coddling of the American Mind with Jonathan Haidt, he argues that one of the reasons you get kind of the woke generation is because the anti-bullying movement taught them that words were violence. And they responded to that so incredibly that they thought real violence was fine in response to mean words. And it's a provocative thesis, yeah. but he has some research that kind of points in that direction. Certainly there's a correlation in terms of time that, yeah, people become very thin skinned when the message is sticks and stones can break your bones, but words are way worse and ideas are dangerous and hide from them. It's like, yeah. no, 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 that is a disastrous. Yeah, so I want to be, yeah, be kind of clear here too, lest people think I'm saying something like burn all the Mormon books again. <laughs> um, for example, I don't, no one should ever bully another right. person and yet i think people should be ashamed of the shameful things they do yeah and in eliminating bullying uh look at this 10 year old boy petitions apple to change its nerd emoji a 10 year old boy has taken it upon himself to petition apple to change one of its emojis teddy from oxford oxfordshire england would like to na rename the emoji that wears black frame glasses and has two buck teeth sticking out, which currently the company calls the nerd emoji. They're making people think we're nerds and it's absolutely horrible. The boy and glasses wearer <laughs> and buck teeth, no, said in an interview with the BBC, it's making me feel sad and upset. And I, f yeah, right. So the, again, the point is that we shouldn't be mocking other people. We should be charitable towards each other. And yet there should be a way to sort of let people know. Like I was in a steak restaurant the other day mm -hmm. with my friend, Father Jason, and a kid came in with pajama pants on and mm. I thought he should feel ashamed. Yeah. And okay, so maybe by shame, I mean something other than a hatred of self. That's not what I mean. Right. But, well, this, but is a, should... this is a good distinction, right? Because a lot of the redefinition of shame is a, a hatred of self. And that's not what yeah, Aquinas means by that's shame. That's not what I mean. I mean, he should have more respect for himself. Yeah. So as not to act in a way that's beneath his dignity. Yeah, very well said. And it felt like that back in the day when we could s <laughs> yell things at each other, <laughs> uh, you know, there was a way to sort of show the group this behavior is unacceptable. Right. And sometimes that was wrong. Like you were right. wrong to think that's right. unacceptable. But sometimes, no, you were right. Like to tattoo your face and dye your hair purple and wear ripped jeans that are barely holding on, something like that. Like having someone in your community say, you look stupid, might be extremely helpful for that person. But if we're no longer allowed to express those opinions, then... Yeah. So, I mean, the two ways a society kind of goes when, when that's the case is either one, there's just no longer any standards whatsoever because having standards is offensive or two, 
and I think more realistically, those standards still exist and they still play a role, mm -hmm. but you don't say them out loud. And so the person that you just gave the example of the face tattoos and the purple hair and the ripped jeans can't get a job and thinks, why is everyone persecuting me? And no one's just like, well, you don't look professional. You don't look, you know, and, and this is mm. an injustice to that person. Because look, there's this important dimension, just in terms of developmental psychology, right? When you're a child, you look to your parents for approval and you need to get two messages. On the one hand, on the, you need to hear you are unconditionally and profoundly loved. On the other hand, you also need, this is good behavior, this is bad behavior. Do this, don't do that. And so often parents go to one of those two extremes and they don't do a good job of hitting the other. Well, that's good. And after you get to really about the teenage years, you start looking to your peers for the same thing. And there's good developmental reason for this because it's not enough for you to survive that you are pleasing to mommy and daddy. You also have to be someone who is well looked upon in society. And so you look to peers and especially older peers and see, okay, is this cool? Is this uncool? Look, I wore like Jinko jeans. I don't know if you maybe you spared this in Australia. Horrible, baggy pants. I okay. for a short period of time. Yeah, I wish somebody I to told wear, me I, I looked to wear ridiculous. The, limp, the kind of limp biscuit Fred Durst belt, <laughs> yeah. you know, where that where hang, hung down. And <laughs> yeah, ninety fashion. This is American culture just poisoning the world. And You're me, welcome, little world. boy, <laughs> poor Perry, <laughs> South Australia, picking up on it. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah exactly. We've, we we've, also had dishwashers and automobiles and airplanes, so thank you for that too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those were from an earlier era. By the time we got to the nineties, we were like, we've run out of good ideas. Here's the bad ones. <laughs> So, yeah, but in, in all seriousness, like there is a role to say this works, this doesn't work. And when we don't have that because we're afraid it's going to hurt people's feelings, that's a disservice to people. Now, you've got to have a way of doing that. You know, there's such a thing as constructive criticism and such a thing as destructive criticism. So I actually agree that bullying, in as much as it's not looking to help the person, is not good, but good can still come from it. Yes, I think that's what I'm saying. And the problem is when that can't happen in the schoolyard, it's definitely happening on the internet. And oh, yeah. usually it's a lot more vicious yeah. and it's anonymous. So you think of these three different categories. One is two friends sitting across from each other. You know, like if I said, and you heard me say before you came on the show, Mormons should burn all books. Because of our friendship, you realized, you probably thought, I don't want to tell you what you thought, but you probably thought, okay, like, I think I know what he's saying. I'm not right. going to, like, skewer him publicly on this. Right. Like, in, a, in, a, in a conversation like this, we give each other the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. We seek to endear ourselves to the other. We seek to say, well, what do you mean by that? You know, we don't. All right, so there's that. And then you have acquaintances, maybe, say the schoolyard, mm -hmm. where you know the person and the person is calling you out on something, charitably or uncharitably. Yeah. But, but when that can't even happen, then you've got the YouTube comment section where burner accounts are saying all sorts of horrible things. Yeah. And they certainly don't have your good in mind and they, they're just trying to be provocative. Right. It's, it's the kind of rush to have a hot take on the issue. And so there's a huge pile on effect where everyone wants to be on the right side because look, everyone is still performing for their peers, even online. Yeah. And so a lot of what's going on is they want to seem like they have the right opinions and the right ideas. And that often takes a form of scapegoating someone and demonizing, you know, the person who stepped out of line. And so, oh, oh I'm blanking on his name. The, uh, the guy who's done a whole book or yeah he wrote a book on this and he's done a lot of other stuff he's the guy who wrote i think he did the men who stare at goats but he anyway he has a whole book on so you've been shamed and what he looks at is he just goes and interviews the people who've become like the internet's person they hate for five minutes and just see how it's destroyed their life while everybody else kind of moved on when yeah. and in most of the cases the person's actually done something wrong it's not that they were just misunderstood. They were they you caught them on a bad day. They were making an inappropriate joke. They were doing something <laughs> offensive. They were being stupid or cruel or yeah. whatever. But who hasn't had yeah. days like that? Yeah. And without any relational context, a billion people just say, We hate you. Yeah. And then it's like, well, now you've lost your job and good luck finding another one. And it's just awful uh so yeah we haven't resolved bullying we've just exported it to the internet yeah and it's it's way worse there than having someone say eh, don't do that that's that's gross that's offensive that's too far yeah. we're ironically having someone in their life to say pump the brakes don't post that online don't even do that would have been tremendously helpful for them yeah yeah that's right um 
I, Brian Holdsworth was here recently and he said increasingly he is coming to believe that social media is an identity establisher. Yes. So it's the way you find your identity by agreeing with certain positions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. shaming other positions and things like this. Yeah, the algorithmic shift that happened maybe 10 years ago was huge. As you start to be able to unfollow people and as the form, you know, I'm old enough to remember when Facebook was just a place where you said you were going to have an apple. <laughs> and it was just like, Joe is dot, dot, dot. And then you just finished whatever you were doing or, oh. and it was banal, but it was mostly harmless. And so those of us from that era have or had friends of wildly different views and everything. It was just everyone you knew. You had it. Oh, we met at a party once. <laughs> Now let's go at each other on Facebook. And it created an actual marketplace of ideas. Now, most of those ideas were stupid and banal, like I'm going to have an apple. But occasionally someone would say something really thoughtful or provocative or profound. And then they moved, they did a couple moves. One, they moved into doing more content sharing, where it was like sharing links and then eventually having things on the platform itself. And two, they started to have uh, things like unfollow. So you could quietly censor everyone you didn't want to hear their voices and so it created this tremendous echo chamber but it also created this tremendous desire to fit in with the people you wanted to follow because mm. you didn't want them to do that to you because you knew if you said the wrong thing oh. the next time you go to follow your friend you might just see the ad friend button the coldest of cold shoulders <laughs> or maybe you don't see it but unbeknownst to you but you kind of suspect it they don't see your stuff anymore mm. because they've clicked unfollow and so it creates this tremendous performative dimension where you have to, you know, every time, like, like this, I'll give a concrete example from my own life. When there is an issue that's a hot button news sort of thing, I feel a strong internal pressure to say something. Mm -hmm. I don't need to. No one needs my take. And I try to resist this impulse as often as I can because <clears throat> why, why pile on? Why add to it? But there's that sense of, oh, you need to say something. And so amazingly, what we took originally is just, you know, Facebook, it was meant to be like that, a yearbook. as a way of keeping in touch with people from high school and college. It turned into everyone on earth becoming a public figure and needing yeah. to release a press release every time there's a news story. Exactly. That's a very good analogy. I've heard a, a different analogy that gets to the same point. I'm told that people in academia with PhDs have to continue to publish to remain mm. relevant. And now we believe that that's true of every us, like every human being feels if I'm not publishing constantly, I'm no longer relevant. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just taking a break. And the ironic thing is, although we're feeling that tremendous pressure, do you really notice when your friend hasn't commented on the issue of the day? Well, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've kind of made a pretty conscious effort not to be commenting on every church scandal thing right. that takes place occasionally if it's very big we'll do a comp but i don't like being beholden to respond to every little thing this happened last year with strickland when mm -hmm. he was what do you say relieved i don't know <laughs> stricken stricken when strickland was stricken uh i said like i'm not i'm not gonna comment on it. and it and it, it it really was because other people are doing this and I don't know more than them, right. nor am I more articulate than them. But see, people were saying, you've had him on your show. Like you, yeah. you deserve, like we deserve you. No, you piss off. Like I'm <laughs> right. not, you, right. n nothing, I d owe you nothing. Yeah. If you're my wife, my children, I owe you a lot. If you're my friends, I owe you stuff. Um, but if you're a rando on the internet, I, I don't. And you might say, well, I disagree because I think the way that public personalities or well, great. Then we have a different interpretation of what we should be doing. Um, so, and then of course you may have, exp so that's, that's the difference. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not just you thinking I have to give my hot take. It's others telling you we need you to. Yeah. Which is <clears throat> just don't like, do that to people. I mean, yeah. it, it does not make the world better by getting everyone to add their hot take. Yeah. The Cause what are you really, why? Like what does, should Bishop Strickland... You know what it is? People want an opinion and they don't yet have one and they want you to help them form one. So I think they, you're right. So that reality can be a safer place than it is right now. I think I used this example the last time I was on this show and I promise I have other examples in my <laughs> life, but this one, uh, I come back to it. I was reading the newspaper, it was uh, in St. Louis, and it was something to the effect of there'd been a hung jury in a murder case 
And they said, here are the facts. You decide. And I thought, what? In the, how am I going to decide? A <laughs> yes. jury heard this evidence for days <laughs> and couldn't come to a conclusion. Yeah. And you want me, as a person who's never heard of this before and has now read one it's like article. A, it's like a patronizing statement, yeah. isn't it, in a way? Like, you're smart enough to figure this out. And it's all may, may also maybe a cowardly way of the person to not make a decision. Yes. Well, I, I think it speaks to something at the heart of us not knowing what we're doing with media in general. So um, if you've ever read Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. A little bit. He talks about how, well, now Texas and England can talk to each other, but do they have anything to say? Yeah. And that's where you get things like, I'm going to go have an apple. <laughs> like, we don't have any, there's no frame of reference. These are not things that God has placed in our life to do something with. Mm. We're just getting other people's decisions. You see what I mean? Like, someone needs to know what should happen with Bishop Strickland. Someone needs to know what should happen in whatever the issue of the day is. Yeah. But, but it's it, not me. Yeah. And the more time and energy I spend trying to form an opinion on whether I think the, the actor acted in an appropriate way... That's all time that's being taken away from me actually figuring out the stuff God has put in my life to do. And do you think that's because, just like you were saying, we seek to endear ourselves to our groups online to show Mm -hmm. them we're still in the group. Here's our badge. Um, Do we then take that into our offline circles as well? Where it's like, gee, what happened with Buddy Strickland? You know, you're like, I mean, yeah, it seems like I think my response the few days after was something like, yeah, it looks really bad. It looks like there's a prejudice coming out of the Vatican where conservative bishops are are kind of given are being stricken. But other people on the left side aren't. But I don't know. I don't know what he did. Right. I don't know if anything happened that I don't know about. And but so just just to not know right. is to be thought a coward. Yeah, yeah. And And yet I I think the willingness to be thought a coward when you actually are correct in saying I don't have enough mm -hmm, to assess mm -hmm. the situation, come to a decision, is an act of bravery in a way. To be willing to to, to, uh, be open to attack. Yes, you are very brave. Is this where we're going? That's, no, that, that is a low key way of me saying <laughs> I am the bravest. Aren't I the hero? Yeah. Yes. No, but you're you're absolutely right that the pressure and I guess I'd say this. I've been in situations where I've occasionally been close enough to see a news thing go down Mm -hmm. in real time and then hear the way it gets talked about in a distorted sort of way. Yes, yes. I've I've got two examples. One of them, I was at a grandparents' day mass uh, with Pope Francis and Pope Benedict was there and beforehand they had school kids who were uh, coming up and, you know, saying things. And one of these kids from Ireland said, oh, you know, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, you guys are great. You're like grandfathers to to me and to us. And Pope Francis had a very kind response about how, as you know, this was early on his pontificate, and that Benedict had been uh, serving in this wonderful role as like a grandfather to him as well. And it made total sense in the context of responding to this Irish school kid. The headlines made it sound like Francis had dismissed Benedict as an old grandfather (laughs) and taken this very sweet, endearing moment and turned it into something malicious. Mm -hmm. And so then if that becomes the question, should Francis have written Benedict off as a grandfather, you can have all the hot takes you want and they're totally divorced from reality. You've got the wrong question. Exactly. And well, likewise, I, I was at the North American College and the public way a certain scandal played out and then the private way where if you had more information was a totally different uh, kind of picture. And it was, it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, people are forming these very ill, not just like uninformed, but misinformed takes. And so maybe the conclusion follows from the premises, but the, prim- the premises are, are false and loaded in some of these cases. I like what you said earlier um, when, when someone says, like, now, nah, here's the facts, you decide. Right? Yeah. I, I even find that really frustrating in a debate setting. I say, yeah. hey, you guys go, you read the primary documents, you read the studies. Yeah. And you're like, well, I came here because I don't have time <laughs> right. or background knowledge to even understand. But it's a way, I think, for the debater to show they're being objective. And if you were to look into this right. yourself, you would come to the same conclusion as myself. This is deeply rooted in our approach to Christianity, and it's profoundly unchristian. What do you mean? That we don't want to be sheep following a shepherd. We want to read all the biblical data, all the patristic data, form all the theological opinions, and then find a church that agrees with us. We want to be the shepherd. We want to be the Pope. We want to be the Mm -hmm. key figure in the religion. And that is not what we're called to be. Like, it's great if you understand theology. It's wonderful if you can understand why the church teaches A, B, C, D, E. 
that's not necessary for the faith. Faith is ultimately still an act of trust. So the church historically has distinguished between what's called religious assent and real assent. Religious assent is, I believe this thing because you tell me so. And real assent is, I believe this thing because I see the truth of it for myself. Mm -hmm. Real assent is great, but you're not going to get that on every issue under the sun. Even as someone who's like full-time in Catholic stuff, there are issues which I just haven't taken a close look at. And so I just trust the church got them right. I've never done a deep dive to say, well, how do we know X, Y, Z? This is true, not just of faith-related issues, but every single thing you yes. believe. Right. That my and wife is actually who she says she is. <laughs> yes. That these stairs that I'm walking on aren't about to collapse. You know. Right. And so this was one of the major things with like mm -hmm. new atheism is they wanted to push back against the need for faith, which was taking this impulse of we'll decide for ourselves to its logical limit. And it is an absolute absurdity. Because even if you say all decide based on the studies, well, there's a huge replication crisis in science where studies that looked right the first time we did them, mm -hmm. we rerun the experiment and don't get the same result. Sometimes it's a hoax. Sometimes it was just a misdesigned experiment. Sometimes, you know, so even when you're deciding, you're actually taking on faith that the evidence being presented to you is what it and claims to be. And not just the be. evidence, but the interpretation of the lead researcher. Right. There's been instances where, I won't n mention the name because this is a vicious woman who's come after me several times. I'll leave it at that. She did a study uh, trying to show that pornography wasn't had didn't have kind of addictive related changes yeah. in the brain. And she was wrong. Uh, well, yeah. her interpretation was, see, it's not like a drug. And then a ton of, well, and not a ton, I think there was ser at least several neuroscientists said, your findings are accurate, you misinterpret them. Yeah. There was a somewhat famous case uh, in Sweden. There were two researchers looking at uh, people who'd had so-called like sex reassignment surgeries. Mm. And uh, Sweden has pretty open medical records. So you can get a nationwide sort of example. So they, they looked at different people who'd been diagnosed with gender dysphoria and they tracked the long-term outcomes of those who'd gotten the surgery and those who had not. And these are about as close as you can get to a perfect widespread case study. And they released this uh, press release and everything else with their study. It's international news that having sex change operations is good for your long-term health and you're less likely to right. attempt suicide and you're less likely to be depressed and da-da-da-da-da. And it turned out they had compiled all the good data and they had misread the numbers. And it said the exact opposite of what they were saying, that actually the people who'd had the operations were having worse outcomes. They were more likely to have attempted suicide, were more likely to be depressed. And it took other researchers to say, hold up, your own tables actually say the opposite of what you're saying. So all that's to say, if, if they, who are doing this full time and seemingly weren't doing this on purpose, because you wouldn't purposely destroy your own reputation, reputation internationally, uh, can get that wrong, what are the odds that me, I'm just going to be like, oh yeah, well, uh, let me tell you the data on. <laughs> uh, of course I'm not going to just, you report, I decide. I want to tell you about Hallow, which is the number one downloaded prayer app in the world. It's outstanding. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Sign up over there right now and you will get the first three months for free. That's like a lot of time. You can decide whether it's useful to you or not, whether it's helpful. If you don't like it, you can always quit. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. I use it. My family uses it. It's fantastic. There are over 10,000 audio guided prayers, meditations, and music, including my lo-fi. Hallow has been downloaded over 15 million times in 150 different countries. It helps you pray, helps you meditate, helps you sleep better. It helps you build a daily routine and a habit of prayer. There's honestly so much excellent stuff on this app that it's difficult to get through it all just go check it out hallow.com slash matt frad the link is in the description below it even has an entire section for kids so if you're a parent uh, you could play little bible stories to them at night it'll help them pray fantastic hallow.com slash matt frad i want to tell you about a course that i have created for men to overcome pornography it is called strive21.com slash matt you go there right now, or if you text STRIVE to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, 
And it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. Of course I'm not going to just, you report, I decide. And I think we're all kind of growing cynical to people yeah. pointing to studies. It's true. Uh, a while back, Trent did that debate with that uh, porn performer, an unfortunate fellow, uh, and with Lila. Yeah. And I thought Lila and Trent did an excellent job. The comments section agreed with you on that video. What? That I, that, oh, that, no, that, the, the YouTube comments, the people overwhelmingly they? seem to agree. Well, the greatest comment, I've shared this on a previous episode of Pints, but the greatest comment was... <laughs> uh, he quoted <laughs> Destiny as saying, you only believe... Sex with animals is wrong because you're religious has got to be the one of the best arguments for religion. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point was the two of them were citing studies and you could even tell that they weren't terribly interested in each other's studies. Right. And I think that's because we just, it feels like you can get a study for whatever you're trying to prove. Yeah. Well, I mean, take, uh, since we're talking about the whole trans topic, <clears throat> the HHS secretary is like self-described transgender, and this is who's funding a lot of these studies. Wow. And so it's like, well, is there a thumb on the scale? Well, of course, because this person's also given speeches about how the science agrees that this is bigotry and there's no other possible reason. So there's a huge, very obvious interest in, we want studies that say, this is okay what I'm doing, yeah. <laughs> and not studies that don't, and I'm cutting the checks. Yeah. Of course you're gonna have these marching orders. So we see this in, in polling all the time. The, a lot of times when the polls are wrong, it's not that there was necessarily wrong, anything wrong with one of the polls particularly. It's that you had a, a cluster of polls that all pointed in one direction. And so then the other polls that would have gone in the other direction, no one wants to be like the weird outlier who says, well, everybody else says mm. candidate A is up by five. I'm showing them down by five. So they just put it in the drawer and they don't publish it. Oh, really? They're not even saying anything false. But they're not challenging the narrative because you don't want to make yourself look like a bad pollster. If you're the only one finding this result, you're getting the outlier. That looks bad professionally. And so you just put it in the drawer. And if it turned out you were actually the one with the best poll. Yeah. You, you don't, I mean, you don't get any rewards for being right. <laughs> but but you avoided the, the, yeah, the public scandal of, of being wrong. Yeah. And so this is one of the, so we see this in professional context, which is one of the reasons there's a problem with studies is there's a strong professional impulse to have a study that agrees with the popular view mm -hmm. that doesn't challenge it in a, a dangerous kind of way. And you pair this, and maybe it's part and parcel with the fact that experts has almost become a derisive term. Yes. <laughs> and that is a little unnerving to me. Yeah. In, in one sense... I like it because it enables us to question narratives that up until now we weren't willing to question. Mm -hmm. But you tell me what you think. It also seems to me that you're seeing even people in the Catholic Church going, okay, well, if I can't trust the experts and they're telling me that men can be women and men can be pregnant and then we didn't go to the moon, evolution must be false. Uh, you know, again, I'm not opposed to people looking into these things, questioning them, coming yeah, out with different yeah. opinions. I'm not saying a Catholic can't hold that evolution is false, all right? But it's just that where does that end if we can no longer trust the experts? Yeah, I think it's quite right to see, uh, I guess we'd call it in like an epistemic crisis of authority, that you have, you know, in the old days, so let's just go Middle Ages. You've got a literate class that are clergy and scholars, and then you've got a majority of the population that's illiterate or barely literate, and of course they're going to trust the church. They're going to trust their priests. They're going to trust the bishop. They're going to trust the scholars of their day because they're the guys who know how to read books. 
Well, now we have just enough information that we can say, well, let me figure it out for myself. And I don't want to knock that because in some ways that's tremendously valuable. But there is this dual crisis where on the one hand, the experts often believe crazy and insane things that you can see visibly from space. No, they're definitely wrong about men being women and women being men. But then if I'm left to my own devices, am I less crazy <laughs> or am I going to go to this like strange? So I understand, I guess I would say conspiracy theories are a very natural reaction to a reasonable distrust of authority, mm -hmm. but they're not a solution. They're and then they sometimes, it's almost like the more conspiratorial you can be, the baser you are. Right. You know, so, or, or to put it a different way, um, if the experts are now my enemies because they're part of the elite class, then whatever they tell me happened uh, can't be the case. Yeah, I, I would just say to anyone listening to watch out for a sort of double standard where you take the official narrative with an extremely high threshold where you say it has to really convince me, yeah. I'm not going to believe it, but then any alternate theory you're way more credulous of. That's not actually a healthy way to approach understanding reality either. And so I see the problems much more easily than I see the easy solutions. Because you can't just blindly trust the experts, but neither should you blindly trust the opposite of the experts. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess I've even thought about writing about this and I've never done it. I, I think there is a dual distrust that the experts are increasingly distrustful of the general masses and hate them. And that as a result, a lot of the reason people react in the way they do is they know they're being bossed around by people who are condescending towards them or, yes. or derisive of them. Yes. Uh, the, Hillary Clinton's remarks about the deplorables. Yes, right. The clinging to guns and religion yes. line from, I believe that was Obama. Yes, it was. That there is this widespread sense of like, oh, you benighted fools. Uh, and people are smart enough to realize you hate me. You don't understand me. You look down on me. You know, uh, Thomas Frank's book, What's the Matter with Kansas? Where it's just like, how could these stupid people in Kansas not realize they shouldn't be super liberal? And it's like, well, because they care about abortion more than they care about a welfare state. Yeah. And that's a reasonable set of policy assumptions. You may disagree with it, but they're not stupid for having different values than you. And so the example I, I go back to is um, in the hunt for the Boston Marathon bomber, or one of the two, they put a citywide lockdown. So the police would be unencumbered by the people oh. and get the sheep out of the way so the experts can do their job and the police couldn't find them. And then finally they lifted the lockdown, the, the shelter in place order. And within a few minutes, somebody had found him. an ordinary guy, just found him in his <laughs> like in hiding in the boat he wow. had in the backyard. And so all that's to say is like, well, what they should have done is trust the wisdom of the masses. Yeah. And, and they didn't. So I, it does seem to me like this, distrust isn't just people are distrusting authorities. Also authorities are distrusting people. And that if there was yeah. more of a healthy uh, mutual right. respect, I think that would be the closest thing to a way forward. Yeah. How would you even begin it? It's, it's almost like, cause you're talking about two people distrusting each or two groups distrusting yeah. each other, which is not unlike two people distrusting right. each other. And if two people who distrust each other are going to begin to trust each other, it feels like one of us yeah. has to show goodwill. It's true. And so I guess if I were, I, I don't have a solution to this, <laughs> but there's good data showing the wisdom of the masses. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a lot of data on who wants to be a millionaire. You know, the who wants to be a millionaire, the classic yeah. form of the show, you had three lifelines. So you've got a multiple choice question with four answers. You can either uh, do a 50-50 where two of the answers go away. You can phone a friend, which is someone you chose as like a particular expert as like, oh, here's my smart friend. Or you can blindly trust the audience by pulling the audience of people you don't know who just happen to be there on the afternoon for the taping. You know which of those three is the most effective? It's funny that I'm going to say I'm going to say what I would do, yeah. not what I would think. I would I would probably phone a friend, um, and I would choose the friend over the sh shouting audience because I think the different answers would confuse me, and I would feel like I don't actually have an answer. But, yeah, but what well, is so the... they, they they poll the audience, so you can actually see the numbers. Okay, then yeah. I guess you're given where you're going with this. I'm sure it's the audience, right? Massively, massively really? outperforms. 
the experts. These are people that you handpicked. So I always point this out in like Catholic Protestant things. Like I understand how you read the evidence in the way you do. Yeah. And I respect that you may have some theologians you trust as experts who are telling you this. But is it really possible that the crowd, the masses, the ordinary That's Christians true. for 1500 years got all of these major issues wrong? Use contraception as a and as a as an example. Yeah. yeah right. Or or <laughs> the views on justification yeah. or you know, the views on the saints, the views on, like, you go back and look at medieval Christianity and it's not just, oh, the experts say X and then some other experts say Y. It's like, no, no, no. We have a whole mass of Christians who all believe the same thing. And so at some point, I think we need to take seriously that there is a wisdom in the masses that ordinary people get this stuff right. Now that's true in religion. Mm -hmm. I think it's also true in just any old kind of regular society. If you've got a position that says, everybody's wrong about this thing. Like it's wrong to have sex with animals to use the example you gave before. Yeah. Well, that should give you pause to say, maybe my, my intuitions or my reasoning has gone off course and I'm the weirdo. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Andrew Clavin who said recently that the left or the elites, uh, hate Trump and fine, but they've, they haven't paused to ask why did the masses want him? Right. It is. You, and I think you see this, you know, the thing we were talking about, the kind of distrust of and even contempt for ordinary people in some of the conscious media decisions that we need to not try to do a fair, nuanced sort of reporting. We need to really put our finger on the scale and say, this is a bad person. Do not vote for the bad. And people realize this is condescending, regardless of your views on Trump. Anytime you're being talked down to by the press, by the literati, by the experts, whoever they are, and being treated like a moral idiot and like a child. Well, it's natural to say, screw you. It's natural to say, like, back off. Mm -hmm. Because you have a natural resentment for that. Now, that's dangerous. You don't want to just go into that reactive sort of mode. You don't want to just be, like, blindly reacting. Because sometimes when people say, this guy's bad, it's because he's bad. <laughs> sometimes when they say, don't put a fork in the light socket, it's because it's actually dangerous, too. But if you're being constantly talking... I guess I'd just say, if, if your position... If you're in a position of authority, don't treat people like that because they can pick up on it. And that's not a, a decent way to treat people. Yeah. Epistemology. I think if I was ever to do like a further study, mm -hmm. I would like to do, I would like to learn more about epistemology because it fascinates me. Yeah. It fascinates me how little I know about everything I think I know. Yes. It really, I mean, I remember studying philosophy and hearing the claim that everything I know comes through the senses yeah, and being like, that's not right. Is it? And then kind of going back and being like, Oh, I guess it is. Yeah. Like if I didn't have my senses, I wouldn't be able to, it's hard to imagine what that would even be like. Right. Or what, let's do that for fun. This is like a Joe Rogan part of the <laughs> podcast. Imagine not having sight touch. So you can't feel yeah. anything, which I presume that means it, like right now you wouldn't sense that you're sitting on something, right? Right. Right. So no sight, no smell, no taste, no hear, no, no hearing, and no what? What would that be? Yeah, like would you? You would be presumably, but would you know that you were? Yeah, I mean, this is I think exactly where we get the enlightenment. Is Descartes asking a yeah. very similar question to this? I think therefore I am. But would you have any data to think? Right, that's the question. And I think Aquinas would say, you've got nothing to think about. And so, what does the experience of consciousness look like when there's nothing to think about? Um, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to wrap one's mind around. I would say this in, uh, in the miracle worker, Helen Keller talks about her experience of object permanence and it's really fascinating. Mean? So before she learned sign language, you, there's a pivotal moment towards the end, um, where I'm blanking on the name of the woman who is helping her teaches her to sign by doing sign language on her hand because okay. Helen Keller can't see or hear. And so the, the principal senses are gone, but she still has a sense of touch. She's not completely without. But before, I'm, I'm so annoyed I can't remember the woman's name, before she teaches her to sign the word water and introduces her to the concept of language, because this is what she's done. She has not just taught her the word for water, she's introduced her to the world of words, that there are objects and they have names. Prior to that, Helen had been oh. in a rage and she had destroyed a doll. Because she had no concept of it having like permanence, which is mind blowing. And then after she learns the word water and suddenly realizes things exist and they have names. And they stick around. She cries for the doll. Oh my. And 
she suddenly like it isn't just like oh now I have a word for a while. It's like she's entered the world in a new way. Wow. I, I obviously you know I'm touched by this by this moment by this scene, and it's, there's something so tremendously heartbreaking about it. But there's also something so incredible. Miss Sullivan, there it is. I think it is. Okay. Um, there's something so incredible about language and about reality. Like, yeah. And there is, I think, a deep and untapped dimension of Christianity about this. Like God speaks the world into being. That there's this close association between the word and incarnation and creation. And, you know, it's through words that these, there's this kind of transformational reality. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. It's interesting that today it seems like a lot of people would be more open to a fleshed out theory that we are um, uh, persons in a video game. Yes. Then they are open to there being a creator of all reality. Yeah, it's... I don't know if it's because it's novel. I don't know if it's because we are so impressed by the magic of technology that, it, that nothing surprises us anymore. <laughs> that Yeah, that seems like if I can text my sister in Australia and she can text back within a couple of seconds, uh, then I guess lots of things are... Yeah, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said he gave it a 50% chance of being accurate, that we're living in a simulation. Is it okay that I don't care at all what Neil deGrasse Tyson <laughs> tells me to think? Okay. Well, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, but that is interesting. I, I find it fascinating because it's like, well, if you asked him what are the odds that God exists. I think he's given it sub 50%, but all the evidence that points to being in a simulation is better evidence for the existence of God. Like, oh, reality seems to be created? Well, you could come up with a dumb anthropomorphic idea of a video game. Is it that we're tired of the God hypothesis, as it were? Yeah, or, or we've dismissed the God hypothesis as ridiculous. Yeah. Because we said, well, there couldn't be an old man in the clouds doing it. There'd have yeah. to be some sort of creator outside the reality. And as a Christian, you're like, that's what we were trying to tell you, but you were so hung up on an old man in the clouds. Yeah. Like you were <laughs> like, well, the Soviets had a, a poster where it was a cosmonaut saying, I don't see any God up here. Oh my. And it's like, that's your understanding of what Christians are claiming? Well, of course. Like, first of all, space is really large. So maybe <laughs> yeah. the Mormons are right and <laughs> you just going, haven't found him yet. Right. <laughs> like you're not nearly <laughs> far enough away to see Cull up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so no, it... But it's that kind of idea that we have this this very small view of God, and it's easier, I guess, to get one's mind around the idea of a video game designer because we have a direct experience of that. Yeah. Or you know, a simulation designer that's just some dude bro living in whatever the upstairs San Francisco is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, is that really a, a more satisfying intellectual explanation? No, but it might appeal to your imagination in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Andrew Jones recently, who's a philosopher here, uh, teaches political theory at the college. One of the new polity guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful guy. My goodness, it was wonderful to talk to him. But he, you know, he was talking about how the atheists keep telling him that the ex most profound experiences he has are less than he thinks that they are, and then have to give an extremely complicated account for yeah. why they're less than he thinks that they are. Yeah. You know, like your relationship with your wife is merely usorial. It's something of a contract. <laughs> it has to do with this and that. And and we sit there and we're like speaking about the masses again, right? Mm -hmm. Like if every civilization in the history of mankind has believed in God or something like God, yeah, maybe we should pay attention to the democracy of the dead. And so he's saying, yeah, that's just not at all the case. Like that's right. not that's not why I love my wife. I, yeah. I, I know that, but it, it doesn't stop there, right? It's it's that also you don't have free will, and right. here's a very complicated explanation as to why, and also you don't exist actually over time right. <laughs> and you're like yeah okay so i i'm pretty sure i exist and i'm pretty sure i'm free to say and believe that i exist and pretty sure i am capable of loving my wife and believing this to be more than it appears so i'm just not going to listen to you anymore right and it, this is this is what i was trying to get you before is if your philosophy leads you to deny the apparent reality over and over and over again that's probably not a problem with reality that's probably a problem with your philosophy and so if you have to tell people, yeah, sure, you have the illusion of free will, but you don't actually have it. You have the illusion of loving your wife, but you don't actually have it. It's ridiculous. So uh, two things here. One in After Virtue, mm -hmm. Alistair McIntyre makes a, a really provocative point that there's a whole subset of people who want mechanical understandings for everyone besides them while not yes. believing those apply to themselves. Okay. So everyone around me is driven by biological impulses and they only believe the things they do because of evolution or because of some Marxist dialectic reason or because of fill in the blank. But that's not why I believe those things. I believe those things because they're actually true. 
Like my belief that everyone else is mechanically determined is a true belief, not a mechanically determined belief. Yeah. So I'm always the one, like as the observer. subjective observer, I'm yeah. always in a different category than the objective reality around me. But it's like, no, no, if all of that's true, you've sunk your own ship. Like if I can't trust my experience of reality because of X, Y, Z reason you're telling me, you can't trust your experience of reality either, including your belief in X, Y, Z. And so the arguments become self-refuting. You can't have a merely evolutionary understanding of cognition and still trust cognition. Because how do you know cognition is accurately reflecting reality? You don't. There's no reason to believe that it would. And so all of these arguments become self-refuting. That's the first point. That's the mm-hmm. highbrow point. The lower brow point is, you know when teenage boys think everybody is making sexual euphemisms around them, and it's like, no, no, you're just a perv. <laughs> okay. That's how I feel to about people. To the all things are impure. Right, exactly. And so the, the experts who say, oh, well, you're actually just riv- driven by these base motives, you're only telling on yourself. Yeah. Like, they, maybe that's true in your marriage that well, you're here's just... An e- here's an example. I had Christopher West on a while back, and we talked about masturbation, and he mm-hmm. had said that Thank God he can honestly say that he hasn't masturbated since he was, I think he said 19, right? One of the comments was, I hate it when people lie about not (laughs) masturbating. It makes me distrust them. You're like, okay, that says way more about you, dude. Right, right. It's like, yeah, I mean, I I couldn't give a better example. Now, that is just such a, a direct, I don't believe that there's anything better for me than the way I've been living. Because it seems so impossible that someone would be actually happy and actually self-controlled and and all of these things. And so, yeah, you see that in a thousand different ways where you imagine somebody's just making it look better than it really is. It's like, no, no, maybe not everybody is actually miserable. Maybe not everybody's actually mired in sin because there are better ways of living and you have to believe and trust and hope. Totally. It's like it's like a feminist who looks at the happy wife and says, you can't possibly be happy. This must be self-delusional. I really am happy. (laughs) Right. And this is not just a one-off. Happiness studies are a thing that they've been polling men and women since like the mid-70s on happiness. And it used to be women were profoundly more happy than men. Mm. And men's happiness has stayed pretty much flatline. I mean, we're not super self-aware. So we're just like, (laughs) yeah, things are fine. Whatever. We're good. But women's happiness has gone precipitously down. Of course. And they went from being so much happier than men to being so much less happy than men. So the feminists trying to respond to this to say, well, maybe women in the 70s felt a a, a really strong need to lie about how happy they were to the researchers. Like they can't take the data. They can't just accept that maybe the data is accurate because it undermines so much of what they've tried to do. Because in trying to liberate women, they've made women largely miserable because now it's not just you can have it all, but you kind of have to have it all, even if you can't possibly do everything you're being asked to do. Mm. Is there an opinion that you've changed your mind about recently? You know, Catholics might be accused, I know Aquinas is accused, right, of not being a philosopher, people Mm. will say. He's really just a theologian, you know, hired by the church. And so he already has preconceived ideas, which he then reasons to, which is just not true. And there's a lot of reasons we could give for that. I'm going to do them. For example, he wouldn't quibble with the Kalam argument if he's just about, you know, <laughs> showing God he is. Certainly he wouldn't deny the most prominent argument for God's existence, uh, namely the ontological argument. Mm-hmm. You know. All right. Yeah. So, but then Catholics are probably accused of that too. So is there an opinion that you, you have changed uh, since you've become a serious Catholic? Oh, there's a lot of opinions that I've changed. Oh, and a lot of times I find myself <laughs> grappling with how to form so this is true in, in obvious ways with the news like what should happen in israel and palestine okay you know it's like every time i hear something am i allowed from, to ask you like what was your opinion when the news broke and then has it developed and so you don't i'll, I'll that, go back like, super far you asked even before you know so i grew up in a household that was like unabashedly israel is great israel yeah. is like it's in the bible so how could it be bad you know it's, it's <laughs> israel <laughs> And I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, you know, my family's views even back then. Their views are more complicated now because we had a trip to go to the Holy Land and we saw the treatment of Palestinians there. And it was mm-hmm. it was really kind of shocking. And I think we all left that thinking, these folks are getting a really bad deal. Yeah. So you're pro Hamas is what you're saying. <laughs> right. That's the thing. That's, That's the only possible. Other, you know, either one, you yeah. like the Bible because it says Israel or you like Hamas. What could, <laughs> but no, it's it's just so much more complicated where. Even something like a two-state solution. If you'd asked me, say, a year ago, I would say, well, a two-state solution seems like the only workable 
answer. And in some ways, that's still my answer. But I realize now, the more I look into this, the harder it is to say, well, how do you actually get a two-state solution when you have Gaza and the West Bank that aren't even contiguous? Mm -hmm. And you have all sorts of issues of, okay, what about the Jews living in Palestinian areas? What about Palestinians and Arabs living in Jewish areas? What about all these settlements that have been created in the last 20 years? Do we just destroy these and, and kick 100,000 people or more out of their homes because they shouldn't have? All of those are really complicated, messy issues where I can say, this is an unjust situation. But I guess what I've come to is like, I don't know an appropriate solution to this that isn't going to make life a lot worse for a lot of people in the short term. And I can't think of one. And so every time somebody intelligent on the issue talks, I'm like, well, that's interesting. But then I hear the other side and think, oh yeah, that doesn't work either. And so I just keep coming back. You know, like what happened to innocent Israelis in October of 2023 was abhorrent should never have happened. And no amount of systemic injustice or anything else excuses murdering civilians. And also, <laughs> we need to do something about the situation. And I don't know what that is, but things cannot just stay indefinitely kind of in the way they are. Uh, so it's one of the, that's an area where very concretely, okay. like I find my views constantly evolving, but precisely because I'm trying to apply like kind of a, a Catholic vision towards this really complicated situation. What I like situation. about your response to my question, have you changed your opinion on something, is that you gave like this really honest, humble human experience where it's not that I've gone from A to B, right. it's that I've gone from A to maybe B and I, A.5 or yeah, <laughs> A right. point B or, uh, and, and trying to be humble. Um, and again, you'll be called a coward for that. Yeah, uh, but, unfortunately, but that's, nuance but, like that is. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like to be to be willingly called a coward. Yeah, can be like a, an act of strength. It really can. Yeah, it's hard to. I can't just like you know put a flag you just up a on my side Facebook profile and, exactly. and, and get the accolades. Yeah, I have to say, yeah, both sides have acted very poorly towards one another, and it's easy to see the bad guys here. Yeah. It's harder to see either the good guys or more profoundly. Well, how do we go forward in a way where these two people can coexist? In peace. Yeah, we like simple narratives, eh? We do. Yeah, like people say Australians are laid back, Americans are loud, the French are arrogant. Like we love that. It's really yeah. good, you know, because it just, I don't know, gives us context to engage with reality. But as soon as you meet someone who's not laid back, who's Australian or whatever. It, yeah, it's it's true. And then things happen. Speaking of I... Australians, I was going to tell you a joke that the Australian government's been giving out those pictures of Cardinal Pell that you have. Pell Grants. What does that mean? What's a Pell oh, Grant? Grant? Oh, ah. you don't have the American context. Pell Grants are student loan grants. Okay. So it's, it's like a loan beat under paper. Okay. So, yeah, Cardinal Pell, pray for us. Oh, I love that man. But yeah, he's a good example of not a stereotypical Australian. <laughs> I mean, not that he's not laid back, but yeah. he just is. Uh, he's more kind of refined, I think, than most. Yeah, I, I'm reading his right. prison journals and, mm. and have, and I'm going back to them, and they're just remarkable. He's such a childlike man, very simple and. Uh, you know, he's writing these journals in prison. He's aware, you can tell that he's aware that these will possibly be published. <laughs> yeah. And yet he's not trying to demonize the prison system or the guards. Yeah. He's not trying to pretend that his experience is much worse than it is. He's talking about watching football tonight. And or he, I was just reading his entry on Good Friday. I didn't mm. watch TV today, uh, except for the news. But I didn't watch the AFL game. Like the fact that he added except for the news. Like he could have just said, I didn't watch TV today because right. it's Good Friday. But right. he's just so transparent and human. And uh, I cannot imagine what it would be like to have the whole country thinking that you've done something despicable that you didn't do. It, I mean, it really and to is have a, a sort of white martyrdom. I mean, because to have been martyred would have been in many ways an easier cross yeah. to bear. Than to have your name utterly besmirched. Imagine right now you're in prison, you're in solitary confinement, mm -hmm. and the and CNN hates you. That's yes. kind of the equivalent of the ABC in Australia. Yeah, and they're doing all these hit pieces, and they've hated you for a long time, right? Yeah. Because you've spoken out against contraception and sodomy, and you've been an orthodox. They hate you, and they are so excited to have this. And you're in prison and you can't defend yourself and you're just hearing things and you're hearing that some people are defending you, but you've got to think, well, even the people who want to defend me, they must have some doubt. Right. You know, like all of us can do horrendous things. So maybe it's possible. Yeah. Just to have that. I mean, <clears throat> I've been in situations where I've known people where there was some kind of accusation of immorality and they've said, oh no, this didn't happen. But there's still that part of you that says, 
well, you say it didn't happen, <laughs> right. but a lot of a lot of seemingly good people have said things didn't happen. So to have someone actually yeah. innocent. Yeah. And then, of course, all seven judges at the Australian High Court overturn and say, yeah, he's, we have no good evidence to oh, think the, he did the this. the accusations were outrageous. I mean, yeah, they were. I, I was in that situation of wanting not to say Pell is innocent when the allegations first came out because I held him in very high esteem. But I also knew plenty of people I've exactly. held in high esteem have had moral yep. failings and even profound, shocking, evil ones. Yep. So it's certainly possible. But then the, you read the details and you say, this doesn't seem physically possible. This doesn't, you know, yeah. this, I, this I, happened I, on a beach and no one noticed or reported? Well, like, yeah, well, I was in Melbourne uh, for several years back giving a talk downtown and they, they took me to the cathedral. They showed me the... Uh, uh, presb- not the presbytery, the sacristy, yeah. where it was said to have occurred and when it, and it was just, it's so insane. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad he was vindicated and I, I, I would like to see him canonized. Um, I'm not canonizing him, but I do ask for his prayers. Amen. Uh, kind of a pell bearer. strong Australia. Yeah, very good. Very good. <laughs> I had to use one you'd get. <laughs> strong Aussie. And he's also a big fan of Aussie rules football and it's so beautiful to read his diaries and to have him talk about footy teams that I <laughs> grew up watching and, He's yeah. like your uh, blessed Carlo, you know. Yeah, those how, Carlo Cutis. Yeah, you know, I know who he is, but how is he? He, he like likes that? soccer and everything. Uh, he's just like he seemed very relatable yeah, and really yeah. down. We're just like, oh yeah, this is not a golden legend. <clears throat> this is a fully fleshed out human being who has human likes and interests and everything else. And there's something to that, you know. In um, Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory. Okay, uh, I haven't he, read it. Okay. Oh gosh, it's so good. The whole thing is set in the 1930s, and it's got uh, the main character is known as the whiskey priest. He's never named in the narrative. And it's this priest who is a struggling alcoholic. And he's trying, you know, this is 1930s Mexico. Catholicism has been outlawed and it's illegal for a priest not to be married. And this is, I mean, all that's true. All that really happened. And it's a capital crime to be a Catholic priest who's unmarried and, you know, practicing the faith and all this. And so this is a priest who's had numerous moral failings. He's had a mistress, he's Mm. an alcoholic, and he's not painted as this kind of ideal at at all, but he's also striving to be faithful to the Lord in spite of all of his past failings and ongoing moral stumbles. And this story is told alongside a second story of a boy reading about the golden lives of the saints uh-huh. and being bored by the book and then seeing this priest yeah. and wanting to become like a Catholic. Yeah. And Green's point is like, I mean, he's a little heavy handed there, but it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People aren't actually drawn to the whitewashed, photoshopped, uh-huh. painted over version of the saints. They want to know what are the struggles? What are the real life? Where can I actually see myself becoming a saint? And if it's having no struggles or problems at all, and sanctity is not for me. I wonder if in a thousand years from now, should the world still remain, that there is a different understanding of sanctity by nature of the fact that there will be canonized saints who use Twitter. Yes. And what I mean by that is, as you say, you have a bad day, there it is forever. You know? Right, right. So so other, rather than like, oh, there's these really cute anecdotes and cool, awesome, good stories about, say, St. Anthony of Padua or someone. Yeah. But we don't know what it was like necessarily when Anthony Padua had a bad day and did something he shouldn't have maybe, you know, and we almost like don't like to think about that. That's yeah. almost like, don't, don't, you shouldn't say that. But if he's human and if the way of sanctity is this slow, gradual one for most of us, then it m- might be helpful to have a more sort of, well, I guess we're beginning to see that even now, right? With the yeah. canonization of St. John Paul II. Yes. It's like, well, he made mistakes and he made bad decisions. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. So what's the point? Sorry. You know? Right. I mean, even if you look at the reasons some people aren't canonized, uh, you know, Garrigou Lagrange, it's like, well, he had bad political views. It's like, well, yeah, oh. but if you were to go back further, most saints probably had weird political views that wouldn't fit neatly into I modern. I didn't realize that that was the reason. I mean, I don't know that it is the reason, okay, but, but it seems one like of one of the reasons, you know. Like I heard that the reason Thomas Akempis mm-hmm. isn't canonized. I don't he, know if this is true. Yes. He clawed at the, the coffin. Claw marks on yeah. his coffin. <laughs> so the conclusion was, well, we don't know if he died in a state of despair. He probably bloody did and probably had every reason to, you know, but, but yeah, that, that's really interesting. Yeah. But all that's to say, you know, I think we're going to have to have something more generous than a one strike you're out kind of policy for canonizing saints, which is good, which, you know, to be able to say this person is a saint in spite of all these failings where we avoid the dual errors of this person made public mistakes and therefore they're not a saint or a saint believed this, therefore it's good. Yeah. We have to be able to say, no, there's another way. As you were sharing that, I was reminded, a priest I know who's now deceased uh, was 
invited to the priesthood by St. Jose Maria Escriva. Wow. And he lived with him. And so he knew him very, very well. And he tells this funny story about a time. I would love time. to hear all the stories you have right now about <laughs> this. Because I love Jose Maria Escriva. Uh, so, okay, this was my first spiritual director, Father Arnie <laughs> Panula, God rest his soul. Very saintly man in his own right. I, he was my spiritual director for two years and never once mentioned Jose Maria was the guy who'd recruited him for the priesthood, that he knew him personally. He would be in my bio. I, exactly. <laughs> I would start with friend of Jose Maria, Joe Heschwein. I would, just be, I would lead with that. There's a statue of the guy in the chapel. He never once says it because he's so profoundly humble. Yeah. I don't share this. I'm mentioning like a Father Ari Panulo is my, you know, I've got this connection to this holy guy. But then when I... I I had to confront him about this. And then he tells me this hilarious story about this time that he had been telling a story in the presence of Jose Maria that had a bad word in it. And Jose Maria covers his ears because he knows the word is coming. Father Ernie doesn't say the word. But then later, Jose Maria says, oh, listen to the language he's using around me. And so Father Arnie says, that's the time Jose Maria slandered me. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I didn't actually say it, censored it. But he had his ears covered and didn't know. And it was like, the whole thing was very jokey. And it was very, yeah. you know, they were, they were having fun with oh, each I other. See. Even in the covering of the ears. This yeah, there's this kind of like, of he, was, he was kind of playing around. Yeah. Uh, but, and then also like, it wasn't really slander. It was, but it was, it showed this profoundly human side yeah. where he, the saint seemed like a real person. He seemed like a person with real passions and emotions and, and yeah. you get that I think you get that with Jose Maria more than some yeah. because you see the <laughs> the irascibility you know yep. you proud why <laughs> you know that those kind of lines where you're like oh okay he, I'm sure he had some rough edges sometimes yeah yeah whereas like when you read uh, the lives of the saints where they it's like they're they're they they're given they come out of the womb and they're right you know it's like it's Bible. like reading a um, or watching a modern female hero where it's like, no mistakes at all. No, there's no hero's journey because we can't acknowledge any sort of flaws. Exactly. And That's it's a great so analogy. much less interesting to, to actually see that compared to an actual And not just struggle. less interesting, but probably not true. And right. that's what's it's, more important. It doesn't ring true to life. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't, yeah, it is both of those. Like things. if we are to believe that we are being called to be saints, then we're going to need to have, it's going to be helpful for us to look at people who were knuckleheads like right. us, who went forward and back and... Yeah. along the way by God's grace. Exactly. I mean, you you see that kind of growth. Like, even just to give the example, Luke Skywalker's journey is much more understandable, realistic, and relatable than what's her name, Ray. Okay. In the in the what's her name is exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's like well, there's nothing there. It's two dimensional. That's that's an yeah. idea. It's a trope. It's not an actual human <sighs> journey. Yeah, that's really good. I hadn't thought of that before, but that's really good. Well, as we wrap up. Uh, Shameless Potpourri is your YouTube channel, we'll, yes. and it looks terrific, by the way. Really oh, thank good. you very much. Yeah, we'll put that. Do you do that once a week? Or? Yeah, it's once a week, and it goes eh, roughly an hour. So people who've made it through this, you can make it through an episode of mine. I, I just yep. won't have any cool Australian accents, and I'm not going to try. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, and it covers whatever theological topic or topic in apologetics that I happen to be wanting to talk about that week. And and so it's, you know, I, I actually I script it out. I kind of prepared a little bit, but I cover anything and everything under the sun. Any books on Mormonism forthcoming? Possibly. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of your other guests mentioned that he'd reached out to me to uh, do a book on Mormonism and I hadn't gotten back with him, which was all true. Yeah. It was like, oh yeah, I need, to, I need to email him back. I've, okay. I've got, you know what, if people want to respond in the comments, I will try to check them whenever this goes sure. live. Um, yeah. I've got a few different books I want to cover. I want to do a book looking at kind of the Reformation on trial using St. Edmund Campion's Decem Rationes, where he makes 10 arguments against the Reformation. Mm. Uh, second, I want to do a book responding to Mormonism. Third, I should probably do a book on the reality of exorcisms and trying to give kind of a sober assessment, because a lot of times it, people go to one extreme or the other with spiritual warfare sort of things. Uh, or the fourth possible book is one on just kind of the spiritual toolbox. So we hear talk about you know the infused virtues, the supernatural gifts, the charismatic gifts, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All and what does all of that mean? And how do I use that in my actual life? So those are very different. <coughs> I like you know, that. very <laughs> different. Books. I personally like the first one. Yeah, that would be my. I'd pick that up. All right. You know, Good. I I wonder if um, you know we're seeing people obviously say they write a book and then they read the book for Audible. I think mm -hmm. what we might. I think what would be good to, to see is you don't only write the book and publish it and then release it on Audible, but then you do sort of like a video essays where you yeah. read a chapter 
and you make it very engaging and release it on YouTube. And at the end of that chapter, you promote the book. Yes. That would be really good because I think if we're to be honest, a lot of people are consuming these ideas on YouTube. Oh, absolutely. So, so your idea about the, what was the first one you and said? The Reformation that, on Trial. Yeah. And yeah. you said how many arguments? 10? Yeah, there's 10. So like, I'd love to know that. And, yeah. and it would be really cool if you were to write that out and release it. And I would, and maybe you do one at a time and you call it something creative. I'd be fascinated, especially if it was done really well. And then I'd likely buy the book, you know. Yeah, that's smart. I like this idea. Well, when, right, this, when this happens, you're going to be like, I think I know where that came from. That's right. Well, Joe, it's always nice to talk to you. Thank you for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me.